So I'd like to welcome all of you. Uh, when we uh, set up this uh, program, uh, coming uh, after so much time within the academic, uh, the pandemic, uh, we had no idea whether we'd have two or 200 people showing up. This is perfect. So thank you for being here tonight. Also, thank you to Transom Bookshop. Uh, books, uh, you, uh, this is the beginning, I think, of a beautiful friendship between us and Transom, which is newly opened in Terrytown, uh, because we have uh, many illustrious authors uh, speaking to us, and it's so delightful to have them come and assist in a book signing. Uh, so I'd like to uh, welcome you, Justin Martin. And we are very excited to have him talk about this amazing topic, um, Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, he is one of the most unique characters you will ever hear about. Uh, so many facets to his personality. Uh, Justin uh, is, his specialty is American history. And within American history, he's noted for meticulous research, but yet he writes with a page-turning ability that you would normally find in fiction writing. So it's a great combination. So although the book looks a little thick, you would be surprised at how quickly you will get through it, and it has wonderful pictures. He's the author of four more additional books, and I was trying to find what's in common with the topics. And I can only conclude that each one of the events or people um, made a real difference, and sometimes through circuitous routes or unexpectedly. Uh, so the other books are A Fierce Glory, Antietam, The Desperate Battle That Saved Lincoln and, and Doomed Slavery. Uh, Rebel Souls, Walt Whitman and America's First Bohemian Bohemians, Nader, Crusader, Spoiler, and Icon, and Greenspan, the man behind money. You can see as a far-ranging interest, and uh, you, you find the thread between those folks. Uh, that was the best I could do. <laughs> Martin is a former staff writer for Fortune Magazine, and his writings, apart from the, his several books, have appeared in many prestigious magazines. Uh, he also um, is a graduate of Rice University, 1987, and uh, he lives in Forest Hills Gardens, which is a landmark New York City neighborhood designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. With that, I would like to welcome you, Justin. Thank you. Well, thanks for that um, very nice introduction, Sarah. And it's an honor to be here speaking at the Irvington Historical Society. It's also nice to have a few friends from nearby Sleepy Hollow who, who came today. And um, um, it's Great to be here. Um, and my speech tonight is called Frederick Law Olmsted, American Visionary. I'm going to tell you Olmsted's entire life story in about half an hour. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm going to, the first part of my speech, I'm going to focus on all the career eddies and dead ends he traveled down. Um, he tried all these different things. Um, and then in the second part of my speech, I'm going to focus briefly on three of his greatest projects with an eye toward how all the different things that he tried out, nothing was wasted with them. He was always drawing on his previous experiences, and that's why his creations are so singular and so set apart. So it makes sense to begin at the beginning. Olmsted was born on April 26th of 1822. So as you can see, 1822, it is the bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of his birth. And this year has been a big year as far as people appreciating his vast legacy. Now this is a monument um, where in downtown Hartford, Olmsted was born in Hartford. If you look on the monument, you'll actually see a Kelsey um, who's possibly related to Sarah Kelsey there, a man named William Kelsey. 
And also you'll see the names of some olmsteads about the middle of the monument. People on this monument are all people who are instrumental in the founding of the community of Hartford. And um, Olmsted, he was born in the pretty prosperous circumstances. His father was a well-to-do dry goods merchant. Now, one of the things that would really stick with Olmsted from his upbringing in Hartford was his family was in the habit of taking these horseback excursions out into the surrounding countryside. And Olmsted was a little guy, he'd ride in the saddle up in front of his father. And one of the things that would really stick with Olmsted and shape him was just for hours on end, his family would ride without saying a single word, just in silent contemplation of nature. This really shaped Olmsted. It also really shaped Frederick Church. Church was born in Hartford about the same time as Olmsted. Um, they're actually distantly related, although strangely enough, there's no record of them ever having met. Church would grow up to be one of the foremost landscape painters in the 19th century. This is a painting by him called West Rock New Haven that dates to 1849. So when Olmsted was 14 years old, he dropped out of school. That was not unusual in this era, but it did mean he was gonna have to find some kind of useful profession. And the first thing he hit upon was to become a surveyor. That made perfect sense. Surveying was certainly an eminent profession, but Olmsted did not take it very seriously. While pretending to learn the profession of surveying, Olmsted was in the habit of sneaking off, hiking in the woods, canoeing, fishing, as a consequence, Olmsted learned very little about surveying, but certainly served to deepen his appreciation for his native Connecticut. Now, about this time, Olmsted's father decided time for this boy to get focused, time for him to settle down. So his father arranged for him to move to New York City and get a job in a merchant firm. Now, Olmsted, he hated this job. He hated the long hours, he hated the regimentation, he hated the sens sensation of being shackled to a desk. But the only thing he liked was periodically he was called to go on board of ships that were docked in New York Harbor to inventory their wares. And it was while doing this that Olmsted hit upon a new possible vocation. He decided to become a sailor. And once again, this made perfect sense. Sailing was a profession in this era at least that was available to someone with limited formal schooling. And Olmsted came by this desire honestly. You go back down through the generations and Olmsted after Olmsted had gone to sea. So in April of 1843, Olmsted set off from New York Harbor aboard a ship called the Ronaldson bound for China. On July 4th of 1843, as the Ronaldson was rounding the Cape of Good Hope, right beneath the southern tip of Africa, encountered an absolutely ferocious snowstorm. The ship at this point was traveling through the southern hemisphere the southern hemisphere, it's possible for weather patterns to be reversed, so you get some pretty severe winter weather, even on July 4th. And this storm was incredible. Olmsted took a look around at his fellow sailors. He could see fear in their eyes. He thought, ship really might sink. About this time, the captain of the Ronaldson gave the order to furl sail. What this meant was roll up the sails. The, the wild winds were whipping this way and that, and the sails were actually acting as a detriment. The ship had become impossible to control. So Olmsted and his fellow crewmen, they rolled up the sails and then they went below deck. And for three days and three nights, Olmsted huddled there while the ship was tossed on the open sea, completely unmanned, completely uncontrolled, pictured almost like a cork. Olmsted expected at any moment the ship might split open, he'd be pitched into the icy sea and a certain death. Fortunately, that did not happen. The ship continued on to China. It delivered its load of US goods and picked up a load of Chinese goods for the return voyage. Along the way, Olmsted experienced all manner of privations. He did not get enough food. He didn't get enough sleep. He didn't get enough water. He watched as his fellow crewmen were whipped for even the minorest of infractions. So in April of 1844, when the Ronaldson docked in New York Harbor, when Olmsted disembarked on the dry land, he swore never, ever to go to sea again. <laughs> So this is the very first photograph ever taken of Olmsted, and it dates to not long after he came back from that ill-starred sailing voyage to China. It features Olmsted and four people from his upbringing in Hartford who'd be instrumental in his entire life. Now, Olmsted is easy to pick out. He's the only person in this photograph not looking at the camera. He's looking off to the side with a kind of dreamy, abstracted expression on his face, typical Olmsted. Now, if you look at the 
you look behind Olmsted, there's a young man standing there, his head leaning against his hand, kind of a slight smile on his face. That's Olmsted's younger brother, John. And then Olmsted has his arm thrown around, a guy who's staring at you very intensely with a kind of fierce expression on his face. That's Olmsted's lifelong friend, Charlie Brace. Now, it's notable that this photograph was taken in the 1840s. In America, we tend to think in terms of generations. The generation of people who um, came of age in the 1940s, people who fought and won World War II, we often call them the greatest generation. Well, Olmsted's generation, people who came of age in the 1840s, they had their own very distinct generational attribute. They were very committed to the idea of social justice. And in fact, Charlie Brace, the guy who's been staring at you very intently there, he would go on to found the Children's Aid Society, which revolutionized the treatment of orphans in 19th century America. It's an outfit that still exists to this day. So the next thing that Olmsted tried was farming. Once again, this made perfect sense. In fact, when I was doing my research, I came across a statistic that indicated that 70% of the population in this era was involved in agriculture. So farming was the profession. Now, as was his want, Olmsted kind of bounced around a bit from state to state and farm to farm before settling into a very attractive situation on Staten Island. And this is actually, this is an old photograph of Olmsted's farmhouse. I should mention at this point, they actually serve on the board of an organization that's dedicated to refurbishing this farmhouse. It's still there. It's in a state of disrepair. Our hope is to re restore it to something of its former state open it up as a museum dedicated to agricultural practices in this era, also dedicated to its most famous resident, Frederick Law Olmsted. So Olmsted was a very enthusiastic person. He got very excited about things. And while he was farming on Staten Island, when he learned that the French king, Louis Philippe, had abdicated the throne, he became so worked up that he dashed to a nearby farm to share the news. He didn't even know who lived there. Well, as it turned out, it was owned by a man named Cyril Perkins, and living with Cyril Perkins was his 18-year-old granddaughter, Mary Perkins. Now, Olmsted made her acquaintance. He found they had a huge amount in common, but to use the modern terminology, he put her in the friendship zone. He did not see much romantic possibility there. However, Brother John was in studying medicine in nearby Manhattan. He was in the habit of visiting Fred out on Staten Island whenever he got a chance. John met Mary. They felt very different about one another. They fell in love, and they would get married. So with farming on Staten Island, Olmsted was finally starting to settle in. He was finally finding a profession that suited his talents and his abilities. But then he learned that his younger brother John and Charlie Brace, remember the guy who'd been staring at you very intently in the earlier slide? He learned that they were planning to take a walking tour across England. He became almost pathologically jealous. He desperately wanted to go along. He started writing a series of letters to his father in which he begged to borrow the money necessary to go on this walking tour. And in these letters, he comes up with all kinds of reasons. For example, he lists some various health complaints. I think he just made them up. He also suggests that now, when he's a young man, it's the right time to go to England. If he waits until he's older, maybe he'll be jaded, unable to appreciate the experience. But the winning argument, the argument I think carried the day, was Olmsted pointed out that England was in the seat of scientific farming. If he went on this walking tour, he was certain to pick up some best practices in agriculture, which he could bring back with him to his Staten Island farm. Well, um, Olmsted's father always had a soft spot for Fred. He quickly relented, and he gave him the money necessary to go on this trip. Now, when Olmsted returned to Staten Island, he was met with a very fortunate circumstance. One of his neighbors was a weekend hobby farmer, a man named George Putnam. And during the week, Putnam's job in Manhattan was heading up the publishing company that he founded, that bears his name, that still exists to this day. Putnam approached Olmsted to see if Olmsted would be willing to write a book about his walking tour. Olmsted readily agreed, and he wrote a book called Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. Now, the reviews were tepid. The sales were extremely slow. But Olmsted had now made a kind of incredible transition. He'd gone from being a surveyor to a clerk to a sailor to a farmer to now he kind of toe-dipped into writing. This image that I've had up for a while here, this is actually a sketch that Olmsted did 
during that walking tour through England, which would appear in that book. So now an absolutely extraordinary circumstance comes Olmsted, Olmsted's way. The year is 1852, and there's a brand new newspaper. It's called the New York Times. It's a startup. And this paper is in a competitive fight for its life. This is the era when a big city like New York has about a dozen dailies. So Henry Raymond, the editor of the Times, is trying to figure out a way to separate his paper from the welter of competition. He hits upon the idea of sending a correspondent to the South the report on slavery. This was about a decade before the Civil War, and tensions were running very high between the northern and southern regions of the United States. Well, Olmsted, he applies for this job. He has a five-minute interview with Henry Raymond, the editor. He lands his plum gig. You might be thinking, he sounds pretty underqualified. At the times, it was a startup, so it was in that classic kind of all-hands-on-deck startup mode. Olmsted did have a writing credit. He'd written that book. But maybe most significantly of all, Olmsted was a farmer, and the South in this era was nothing if not an agrarian society. So in the autumn of 1852, after the harvest was over, Olmsted was still a farmer by trade, he set off for the South. He went everywhere, he talked to everyone, he produced a spectacular series of dispatches that helped put the brand new New York Times on the map. And while traveling through the South, Olmsted painted just a withering portrait of the institution of slavery. He had something to compare it to. He'd recently visited those model farms in England. He also ran his own operation on Staten Island. He paid his employees, and they were free to leave, unlike slaves. At the same time, though, Olmsted tried to be a very open-minded correspondent. So along with painting a withering portrait of slavery, as Olmsted traveled through the South, he found the region to be one of just surpassing natural beauty. And this image I've had up for a while here, this is actually another sketch Olmsted did, this time while traveling through the, through the South on assignment for the New York Times, this would appear in a book he wrote on his travels. So Olmsted had now been the transition into what he called the literary republic. And next he decided to take the plunge. He decided to leave Staten Island, move to nearby Manhattan, give up on farming, try his hand instead full time as a writer and editor. He got a job at a magazine called Putnam's. It was a very estimable publication in that era. It's a competitor of Harper's had an incredible stable of writers, Emerson, Thoreau, Longfellow. While working for Putnam's, Olmsted actually copy-edited a couple of short stories by Herman Melville. But now comes an absolutely cataclysmic event in US economic history. It's come to be known as the Crash of 1857. It was a very rapid downward spiral in economic conditions. Putnam's, the magazine where Olmsted had been working, went belly up. Olmsted found himself out of a job. He was low on coal. He had holes in his shoes. He owed money to his father and just about everyone that he knew. So Olmsted was forced to take a job, a very modest job for someone who'd lately been traveling in the so-called literary republic. Olmsted took a job in which he was called upon to knock down structures and drain swamps on a scruffy piece of land, very prosaically named for its position right in the middle of New York City is called Central Park. And Olmsted's job, his very modest job, was simply to clear this piece of land for someone else's design. Enter Calvert Vox. Now Vox was a trained English architect. He took one look at the existing design for Central Park. He was disgusted. He could not believe how amateurish it was. And Vox, he had friends in high places. He'd recently designed the Fifth Avenue mansion of one of the board members of the future Central Park. So Vox started approaching the board. I'm going to paraphrase here, but he said, in England, where I'm from, if you want to get the best design, you hold a public competition. Well, the board had listened to Vox. It tabled that amateurish design, and it, it announced a new competition soliciting designs from the public. At this point, Vox sought out Olmsted to see if Olmsted would like to be his partner on the design competition. Now, Vox couldn't care a whit about the fact that Olmsted had lately been traveling in the so-called literary republic. This meant nothing to Vox in this context. The reason Vox wanted to be partners with Olmsted was because Olmsted had been out in a scruffy piece of land, knocking down structures and draining swamps, and Vox perceived that Olmsted literally knew the lay of the land. So the pair of them, they teamed up. This is it. This is their original design for Central Park for that contest. 
dates to 1858. This was Olmsted's very first foray into landscape architecture. He brought all kinds of innovative ideas, drawing on all of his previous experience. He also brought to this project all kinds of wild ideas. Now, there are 33 contestants for the public design competition. 32 of them produced designs that rate somewhere between a B minus and a flat F. Olmsted and Vox, they produced an A plus. It's instantly recognized as the winning design. They won the contest and they were hired to execute it. So building a large public park is a massive undertaking. And right at the outset, the Central Park Board made what I think was a very wise decision. They decided to open the park in stages as portions of it were completed. They figured if they waited 10 years or whatever it was going to be until the park was done um, and maybe had like a public ribbon cutting ceremony, it could be pretty anticlimactic. So they decided instead that when a portion of the park was completed, they would open it to the public. Now, Olmsted was very heartened to see that as portions of the park opened up, all different kinds of people from all different backgrounds mixed and mingled. And so with landscape architecture, something Olmsted just kind of fell into. He found a worthy way to answer that generational mandate of providing social justice. In fact, Olmsted would describe Central Park as a democratic development of the highest significance. Now, if you look at the inset image there, while Olmsted was working on Central Park, Another big event happened in his life. He got married, and his bride was none other than the former Mary Perkins, his brother's widow. Sadly, back in 1857, <laughs> yep, very strange. <laughs> yeah, sadly, back in 1857, um, brother John had died of tuberculosis, and in a heartrending deathbed letter um, to Fred, the very last words he'd ever shared with his brother contained in a PS were, don't let Mary suffer while you're alive. Well, being a dutiful brother, also in a kind of biblical turn, Olmsted married Mary. Um, Olmsted would, raise, uh, would adopt the three children that Mary and John had together and raise them as his own. Olmsted and Mary also had four children of their own, two of whom would survive into adulthood. So in 1861, the Civil War broke out. Given everything that Olmsted had witnessed while traveling through the South um, on assignment for the New York Times, he certainly wanted to be involved, certainly wanted to be involved on the Union side. So he felt, at this point, Central Park was pretty far along. He felt comfortably leaving employ there, moving down to Washington, and heading up an outfit called the United States Sanitary Commission. Now this outfit just provided immeasurable aid to wounded soldiers during the war, and after the war, through a whole series of convolutions, this very organization that Olmsted headed up would morph into the American Red Cross. So I think by now I've established Olmsted was a pretty restless guy. About halfway through the Civil War, he decided that the United States Sanitary Commission was on steady footing. He felt ready for a next challenge. And so at that point, he went out to California and became the superintendent of a gold mine. Now this is an actual photograph of the homely hillside on which that gold mine operated. And if you look at the inset image, that's actually a stock certificate of what was known as the Mariposa Company. I bought that from a collector for $7. That's about $7 more than it was worth in Olmsted's day. So it's often the case, he and his team, they worked the land hard. Very little gold was ever found. So his name was Frederick Law Olmsted, middle name Law. I think it would have been more fitting had his middle name been Serendipity. Because as he was working at that ill-starred gold mine, about 30 miles away was Yosemite Valley. He started visiting repeatedly. He was enchanted. Now, according to one old account I came across when I was doing my research, Olmsted was one of the very first 500 non-Native Americans ever to even set foot in the valley. It gives you an idea of how isolated it was in that era. But Olmsted also perceived that it was only a matter of time before people started pouring in. And so he started raising a kind of hue and cry for the federal government to step in and to preserve this wild place for posterity. Gives you an idea of how prescient Olmsted could be. This was decades before the National Par Park Service even existed. So in 1865, the Civil War ended. All of a sudden, all these communities around the country started clamoring for parks to be built. Central Park had been designed on the eve of the Civil War. Every other large city, they wanted their Central Park. But when the war broke out, they'd had to put their plans on hold. Well, now it was almost like a dam bursting with all this pent-up demand. And the natural team to turn to was Olmsted and Vox, 
So they reunited and they created an entire series of masterpieces across the country. This is um, their sophomore effort after Central Park was Prospect Park. And I love this image, by the way. It's a tree trimming team on some kind of very tall and precarious ladder. <laughs> <laughs> Together, Olmsted and Vox designed an entire park system for the city of Buffalo. And they designed Riverside, a suburban community outside Chicago. Now, I like to think of Olmsted and Vox as kind of like Simon and Garfunkel. They were a very capable, creative team, but they also didn't get along very well personally. They were always at each other's throats. So at a certain point, their partnership broke up. They get together for discrete projects in the years ahead. But from this point forward, Olmsted would continue on solo and create a whole series of masterpieces across the country. And so now as promised, I'm going to describe briefly three of his greatest projects with an eye toward how nothing was ever wasted with Olmsted. He was always drawing on all his previous, all those eddies and dead ends he traveled down. That's why his creations are so singular and so set apart. So the first design I want to describe briefly in the context of how Olmsted was always drawing on his previous experiences is his landmark 1874 design for the Capitol grounds in Washington, D.C. Now at the outset, Olmsted noted there were 21 different places where people entered the Capitol grounds. These were ro where roads ended. And people were in the habit of, they just make kind of a harried beeline for whatever, por um, whatever entryway they wanted to go into the Capitol. And so they kind of, people were crisscrossing one another on the grounds. The grounds were kind of stirred up almost like a farmyard. Olmsted quickly concluded nothing to be done about those 21 entry points. Those were where roads ended. But he thought maybe he could kind of rationalize the foot traffic. So he came up with a plan where whatever point someone entered at, they'd be fed into a narrow tributary pathway. Those narrow tributary pathways in turn fed into a smaller number of broader pathways. Those broader pathways fed into just a handful of broad sweeping pathways that would deliver someone up to just the entry of the capital that they wanted to go into. Now the client, in this case it was Congress, they were puzzled. They'd hired Olmsted the design for, for a beautiful design and here he was fixated on foot traffic and circulation. But this had everything to do, was entirely, relate, was entirely rooted in his earlier career as a farmer. As a farmer, Olmsted sometimes had the unfortunate experience of con conducting goods to market when a wagon would get stuck in a rutted road. It spelled disaster. I mean, Olmsted wasn't going to get his goods to market. He wasn't going to get paid. So once he became a landscape architect, this gave rise to an enduring observation. It went something like this. Doesn't matter how beautiful of a design you create, if there isn't a rational way for people to move through it, it's destined for failure. And so first Olmsted set his mind, as you can see here, to creating a system of circulation. And then and only then did he figure out how to kind of overlay it with this beautiful design that you see here. So the second design I'm going to describe briefly in the context of how Olmsted was always drawing on his previous experiences is his design for the Chicago World's Fair. Now this was a, a really unusual design. First of all, it was a temporary design. It was a World's Fair, so when it was over, Everything had to come down. But Olmsted brought his usual sort of wild, out there vision. One of the things he wanted to do was he thought he, he wanted to bring Lake Michigan right onto the fairgrounds. And so he came up with an idea of dredging these canals, kind of like Venice. And Olmsted had very particular ideas about how people might move through the fair. Of course, they could walk, but he also liked the idea of people traveling by boat. He had very specific ideas of what these boats should look like. He thought they should be small, seating four people maximum, and they should have very brightly colored awnings. Olmsted's vivid mind's eye vision for these little boats was based on the Chinese sampans that he'd seen 50 years earlier during his sailing voyage to China. Now, Daniel Burnham was the administrator of the World's Fair. He was Olmsted's boss in effect. When he caught wind of this, he thought it was absolutely ridiculous. He saw it as first and foremost a really foolish lost revenue opportunity. After all, you have a world's fair, a crowded world's fair, and you're going to restrict people to little boats that seat four people max. So Burnham went behind Olmsted's back and he commissioned a steamship company to service the fair. Now when Olmsted learned about this, he was apoplectic. He wrote a series of letters to Burnham that are by turns obsessive, borderline insane, but devastatingly logical. 
And in those letters, he makes the following point. He suggests that by having a handful of little boats on hand, the greatest good will be extended to the greatest number of fairgoers. And I'll explain. Olmsted suggested over and over again in his letters that if you had steamships at the fair, you'd have people leaning over the railings, waving their derbies, shouting and yelling. The steamships would be blowing their horns. By contrast, of course, of course, Olmsted conceded, very few people would have the opportunity to travel on one of these little boats. However, everybody at the fair would benefit from the ambience of having these little boats gliding down the waterways. Well, the, the Chicago World's Fair opened just on time, right on time, in, in April of, of 1893. Um, and it came to occupy just an indelible place in the American imagination as the White City. Now, Burnham, he was a man of iron will. He met his match in Olmsted because on hand, serving the fairgoers, were just a handful of little boats with brightly colored awnings based on his mind's eye vision of those Chinese sampans from his sailing voyage 50 years earlier. So one final project I wanted to describe briefly and in the context of how Olmsted was always drawing on his previous experiences is his final major project, his swan song, the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina. Now for this project, the client was George Washington Vanderbilt, then the wealthiest person on earth, and Olmsted had a gigantic canvas to work on, 120,000 acres surrounding this very large house. Now for a big project like this, Olmsted certainly wants some help, and among other things, he had his son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. You see a picture of him inset there. He had him come down. He, he was a recent graduate from college. He had him come down to Asheville to serve a kind of apprenticeship to see if landscape architecture was the right career for him. Now, as for that 120,000 acres, it was in pretty poor condition. That's part of the reason Vanderbilt had been able to snap it up at a bargain price. But Olmsted told Vanderbilt, that he would restore the land to its former glory. And he knew of what he spoke, because 40 years earlier, Olmsted had traveled through this very stretch of North Carolina as a correspondent for the New York Times, and he'd seen this land in a more primordial, pristine state. So the Biltmore Estate was pretty far along. Olmsted had gotten a lot of the work done on it, which he hoped to do, when Vanderbilt hired John Singer Sargent, a great portrait painter, to do a painting of Olmsted. Now at this point, Olmsted was an old man. He was worn down from the demands of this project. He was in poor health. And so he found that he was only able to do three sittings, or as you can see, standings for this painting, before he just said he was going to go back up to Boston. People who were there in, in Asheville, North Carolina, could see the project through the completion. Now as for this painting, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. donned his father's clothing, and this painting was completed with son standing in for father. From a symbolic standpoint, you cannot make too much of this. It's literally a changing of the guard. And sure enough, just a few short years later, Olmsted, the great man, the 19th century figure, the pioneer of landscape architecture in the United States, would pass away. Stepping into a profession ready-made and waiting for him would be Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., who proceeded to create an entire series of landscape masterpieces across the country in the 20th century. Now, everything I've showed you to this point have been vintage images of various Olmsted creations. I thought I'd end by showing you some various full-color photographs um, of various creations. I hope what this does is gives people an idea of the variety of work that Olmsted did, also hope it gives people an idea of how intact some of these projects are. Now for this last part of my speech, I'm not gonna provide much commentary. We'll just kinda end with a slideshow. So Olmsted designed a campus of Stanford University. Here's Belle Isle in Island Park in Detroit. The Druid Hills neighborhood of Atlanta. Lake Park in Milwaukee. Yes, Olmsted designed the grounds of the, of the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Here's a modern aerial shot of the U.S. Capitol. Now, I like to think of this as Congress's yard, and they've had about 150 years to meddle with it. 
Um, it's a testament, you can see the inset original blueprint. It's a testament to the practicality of, the design, of that design. Also a testament to its beauty that's been left pretty unchanged for a century and a half. Here's Delaware Park, the jewel of an entire park system that Olmsted and Vox created for the city of Buffalo. Shawnee Park, absolutely gorgeous park in Louisville, Kentucky. And here is Rockefeller State Park um, nearby in Pleasantville. Now, with Rockefeller State Park, Olmsted, um, as he did with Vanderbilt, he often worked with very wealthy clients. And so in this case, um, he worked with um, William Rockefeller, brother of John B. Rockefeller, um, and um, designing the grounds of a big estate um, called, a big mansion called Rockwood Hall. Rockwood Hall is at this point is just some of the elements of the foundation remain. And as for Olmsted's original plan, it's been kind of integrated into um, Rockefeller State Park. And just a few elements have exist to this day, such as some of the carriage paths that Olmsted laid out for the original Rockefeller Estate for Rockwood Hall. Some of those have been turned into um, footpaths in the park as it currently exists. And here's Central Park as it will look in a few weeks when we get some snow. <laughs> so I'm going to close by saying that it's wonderful that when a person travels around the country that they'll find that Olmsted's vivid 19th century vision is still so very alive and so very with us today in the 21st century. So thank you very much. Thank you. And if people have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. I yes. Have a question. I'm curious about your process of choosing to do this research about Olmsted and writing book. Why did you choose? He's obviously a fascinating man, but before you did your research, what did you know about him? And what led you to, to, to Olmsted? What got me into Olmsted was I, um, you know, I got. When I first went to Central Park, as so many New Yorkers, it was just a nice park where I'd hang out and play frisbee or have a picnic. But over time, I started to learn a little bit about Olmsted. And then I, I moved to Forest Hills Gardens, um, which is a neighborhood designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. And then a good friend of mine became a tour guide for the Central Park Conservancy. And so she kind of trying to treat me like a guinea pig. She'd, she'd have to practice a particular tour of the park, and so she'd take me on that tour. So at a certain point, I started to think, this Olmsted guy is just kind of following me. <laughs> and I thought, thought, I'll look into him more deeply. And, and um, you know, he, he, he certainly um, compelled me and, and um, you know, proved, proved to be a, an exciting subject. So. Yes? What was his role in Niagara Falls? And, and the question is, what was his role in Niagara Falls? And his role there was, I mentioned um, in the speech that Olmsted had gone out to Yosemite and made this hue and cry for preserving Yosemite. And it, and it was actually a little more than a hue and cry. He actually wrote a document and he met with some journalists and so forth. And he had a kind of a, a second, it was almost like a corollary profession that, that dovetailed very nicely with landscape architecture. And that was being an environmentalist. And so Yosemite was his first, he was early to that um, project. But he also was involved in other preservation efforts, including Niagara Falls. And Niagara Falls, when Olmsted became involved in it, was then the top tourist attraction in the United States. It was really in a pretty decrepit state. It had a lot of commercial things, like it had a lot of signs up. It had all kinds of had wires stretched out for people to do, um, you know, to, to walk on the wires and so forth. Um, and so Olmsted was actually involved in, um, you know, sort of getting rid of some of the clutter, the advertisements and things. Um, and also um, bringing in pathways and things so that, that, so that people could both interact with Niagara Falls with the same way, say at the same time, you know, they'd be sort of restricted to certain pathways which would keep them from, you know, wandering into different parts of the ground. So, so yeah, so basically throughout his, after Yosemite and really through his entire landscape architecture career, he was both doing park work but also involved in conservation. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I, I remember in your book you mentioned that he wrote an argument against slavery from the economic uh, standpoint, uh, arguing that farms uh, uh, worked by um, uh, private owners and, 
and paid uh, workers were more profitable and more efficient? And I wonder if you could expand on that. Sure, the, qu the question was some discussion of Olmsted's very unique um, economic um, criticism or criticism of slavery on economic grounds. And so, as I described, you know, Olmsted, he, part of the way he got this gig with the New York Times was he was a farmer. They wanted to send a farmer down to the South, which was an agrarian society in that era. And one of the things that Olmsted really witnessed was just the preposterous inefficiency of slavery. I mean, in, with slavery, um, if a slave was sick, they could not work. Young slaves could not work. Old slaves could not work. Um, and so it was a very, and of course, even more significantly, no slave wanted to really give a lot of their effort because they did not reap the fruits of their efforts. So for those, for those reasons, Olmsted was a very acute observer of this just kind of ridiculous system that was actually really in place not to produce agricultural bounty, but rather a sort of an apartheid system in which one group of people could feel good having another group of people in subjugation. And so, and so it was really a very inefficient system that was being clung to. Um, and he had great observations. Like at one point he was at a plantation, he saw the overseer would move to one side of the field and the slaves would get to work and the other slaves would stop working. Then he'd come back to the other side, they'd start working. Uh, and, so, and so the interesting thing about Olmsted's writings is you see him make a transition from being a very, very um, ferocious critic of slavery on economic grounds, but then once he was actually exposed, unlike so many Northerners, actually once he was actually exposed to the institution of slavery, not only did he, um, not only did he have an economic criticism of it, but after observing it firsthand, he also was found it morally repugnant, which certainly shines through in his writings as well. Yes. The question was, what is his relationship to Washington Irving? A great, um, a, a great local question. So, <laughs> and, and the only relationship that I know that he had with Washington Irving was when Olmsted, if I remember correctly, when Olmsted um, applied for the job, the very first job he had clearing the grounds at Central Park. At that point, he was a pretty well-connected figure, having worked for the New York Times and worked for, um, for, for Putnam's Magazine and so forth. So in an act of supreme overkill, he got a gigantic letter of reference or references signed by Alexander Hamilton's son, James, I think was his name, if I remember correctly, a number of other, Whitelaw Reed, if I'm remembering that name correctly, and Washington Irving were among the people who signed on for him to simply clear brush <laughs> from, from Central Park. Um, and if I remember correctly, that's his, um, that was his association with Washington Irving. I'm not sure if there's anything be else beyond that. They obviously would have had some glancing familiarity with one another, probably from Irving being a writer and Olmsted having worked for that magazine. But, but um, as I recall, he, he, you know, he, he acted as a character reference or a professional reference for Olmsted uh, when he applied for that job. Yes? The, the question was, did he, did he develop a strong ideology about open public space as part of a democratic society? And he certainly did. Um, that, was, that was something he really, as I mentioned, he was a, a child. He was a, he was a creation of the 1840s. In the 1840s, you know, it, it's, it's one of its major attributes of people who came of age in the 1840s was a commitment to social justice. In Olmsted's case, he was always looking for a way to express that. And he found landscape arch architecture in the United States in particular was such a great way to, you know, to, to, to create democratic spaces, basically. And this was an era, um, if anybody's been to, say, um, Gramercy Park, this was an era of the private park. There were actual private parks um, in New York City. There were little paddocks and squares where the people who were fortunate enough and wealthy enough to have a home um, around the square would have a key and they could go into that park the exact opposite of anything democratic. And so, and that was, and that was a model, that was a viable age old model, the private park. The public park was a much more um, innovative concept. And so Olmsted embraced the public park as, a, as an idea, as a way of fostering democracy, of bringing all different kinds of people together. 
And one thing that always strikes me about, about Olmsted too is, is he was working at just the perfect time because all the parks he designed, whether it be Milwaukee, Boston, Louisville, on and on down the line, at that point, there was land in the, what, what's now the middle of those cities. And um, had Olmsted not designed those parks, um, you know, just avaricious developers would have filled in the middle of those cities. Maybe there would have been some private parks available to the wealthy and private green spaces. So by virtue of Olmsted's 19th century work, in 21st century cities all over the country, you have really nice parks um, that serve the broad populations of those cities. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about um, how long it took you to write the book and what your research was? Like, where did you find the information? Sure. The question was, was how long did it take to write the book and what was some of uh, my research? It took me, I had a year and a half, my editor put me on a really tight leash, which <laughs> when, when, when I first got the contract, it meant a couple of sleepless nights, what have I gotten myself into? But like most things, you know, you sort of work to fill up. A, 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 in a way, I was happy to ha be on a short leash because it meant I got it done. <laughs> After a year and a half, I was like, okay, I'm, you know, if she'd given me five years, I would have spent five years on it. So um, as for my research, um, what I did was, um, a lot of what I did was looked at his letters, and fortunately he's somebody who, he has a huge number of letters, both that he wrote and written to him. They're collected and annotated in a book collection that's overseen by a man named Charles Beveridge. Um, and so I was able to, to, um, to consult those letters. But even those letters are actually, there's only a portion of, of, of his letters appear in these books with the annotations and so forth, which were immensely helpful. A lot of his letters are also, in, um, that, that don't appear in, in the compendiums or in the Library of Congress. They're now available online, but I worked on the book 10 years ago, so it meant a number of trips to Washington to go through these letters. And Olmsted's handwriting is, is terrible, and so I'd be sitting there with my magnifying glass trying to make sense of what he was saying. And, and, um, but that was really, that was really the, the main source, is, is the letters he wrote and received and was re really gave, gave shape to the story. Yes? I'm wondering, is there anything that Olmsted wrote about the black community that was in the area where Central Park was and that was dispersed and, and removed? And also, were black and immigrants of color allowed into Central Park? Was it originally, when it was created, was so, so the question was, um, the question was, um, did Olmsted write anything about African Americans that were displaced um, from Central Park, um, and then was Central, were, were African Americans and other immigrants allowed into Central Park? So, to take the question in two parts, um, you're referring to Seneca Village, um, which was a, a middle class African American community that um, was, um, it was taken by eminent domain when, um, um, before Olmsted's involvement in the project, several years before they cleared the land of, of people. Some of the people had title to the land, such as the African Americans living in Seneca Village, and they were paid for their homes, although I'm sure they weren't paid anything like what they deserved. Other people that were just sort of squatters on the land um, um, of all different um, stripes and ethnicities, they, since they had no title to the land, they were driven off. Then Olmsted cleared a piece of land um, that really was at that point uninhabited. Um, and he never, you know, he never um, wrote anything about that, about, you know, who'd been on the land before, before he cleared it. Um, you know, but um, per, the, per the second part of the question, certainly from its earliest days, one of the things that made Central Park a very attractive place was it was just, it was a, it was a democratic space and, and, and it, it really, um, it, was, it was that from, from the outset, and, and it was one of the things that Olmsted was heartened by, and it was one of the things that, um, and, and interestingly enough, when Central Park opened, it was treated in the Atlantic, in the New York Times, in every major publication. It was treated almost like the debut of a major symphony by a composer or a, no, a new novel by Dickens or what have you. So and in those rave reviews that Central Park received, there was just, they always have a lot of discussion about 
what a democratic space it is. So you can actually read these reviews in the Atlantic and so forth that are contemporaneous where you get an idea, oh, this is, because that was what people were excited about was here was, you know, here in America, this is a, a democratic space, a contrast to those private paddocks, which I was discovering, discussing earlier. Surely. Yes. The question was, did any of his other children follow, follow him into the landscape um, architecture practice? Um, and what did his children do? Um, and so yes, several of them did. So um, I'll first of all mention Owen, one of his sons. He went out and worked in Montana, I think maybe as a rancher, and he died pretty young. Um, these are the ones not involved in landscape architecture. Charlotte, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, was mentally ill and was confined to an asylum most of her life. Um, but Three of his children, so you got Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. And I'll tell you a brief story if you, if you want to hear it about Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. because it's, it's really telling and interesting. Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., when he was born, they simply called him Boy. And that was his name for the first two years of his life. The reason they called him Boy was because they'd lost, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. and his wife, and, and Mary, had lost two children in the infancy. They were so nervous that they just didn't want to even christen him. Then when he was two years old, he was christened Henry. And then when he was seven years old, they rechristened him Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. I think with the thought, here's somebody who might be able to, I might be able to pass the mantle to, and no pressure. <laughs> so, 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 so you got Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. I don't think he had a choice of what profession he was going into. He, he wound up in landscape architecture. John Charles, um, who is one of the children of John and Mary, um, um, that, that Olmsted adopted, who was about 20 years older than Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. He also went into landscape architecture. And so he had a firm called the Olmsted Brothers Firm. That was John Charles um, and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. together. And that was a firm that operated throughout the, the 20th century. But then you have a third Olmsted child who's working her entire adult life for the Olmsted Brothers Firm. Her name is Marion. Um, she, to all from whatever can be gleaned and it's lost in history, she contributed to a lot of the landscape architecture work that the Olmsted Brothers firm did. Given the era, she did it uncredited. And so there's an Olmsted sister who played a role which is unacknowledged and difficult to reconstruct um, throughout the whole history of the firm. And that's a project, if somebody wants to take it on, it's a good, good project to try to figure out what Marion Olmsted, what her contributions to the Olmsted Brothers firm as a landscape architect were. So, <laughs> any other questions? Yes? So I didn't know that, that he had a partner, that his last name was Ball. Uh, yeah, and he, he's, is he sort of lost to history? Does it, is that, uh, like what, what, you know, um, kind of part did he play in terms of, uh, you know, is he, is he brought up in terms of uh, Central Park and other things? Or, because he always said Olmsted did it, but it sounds like he did it with a partner. That's right. The question is, is, um, is, is Olmsted's partner lost history? Sort of what is his, what is his role and how he's, remem how he's remembered? I'll start by saying his name is actually Vox because as a proper Englishman of French descent, he mispronounced va on purpose, <laughs> the way English people like to <laughs> mispronounce French, French words just to stick it to him. So, so he, he, his name was, was Vox and he, um, um, he um, certainly, you know, um, every time they collaborated, it was, the firm was called Olmsted and Vox. That kind of tells you everything because Olmsted's name went first. <laughs> so, um, you know, he, he, was, he was the, and he was the visionary. Uh, Olmsted had a lot of skills that Vox didn't have. Um, Vox was an architect. And so Olmsted always had to work with an architect. So Olmsted, you might think of him as sort of a compositor of sort of landscape elements. So he had really good ideas of what the plant, what kind of trees the plant. Um, a place like Central Park, the water elements are artificial, so they're, they actually, you can fill them or, or drain them like a bathtub, so Olmsted knew how to design beautiful, you know, artificial lakes and things, but he always had to have a partner who was a trained architect to create things like bridges and also the dairy, um, which is a structure in Central Park where you were to see Liza and I, my wife, get married. <laughs> if people have been to the dairy, it's a structure that Vox designed in, um, in Central Park. Um, 
So basically, Vox designed structures, and for all the parks that Vox collaborated with Olmsted, he would design the structures in the park. Um, and he is kind of forgotten by history. I, I think he's an immensely talented architect, but I guess one way of looking at it is he's an architect, so his projects in a park are going to be bridges and refectories and field houses and things like that. But the park is going to be this big, massive, so Olmsted's going to get sort of the lion's share of credit. And when Olmsted moved on to being a, I described him as being a solo practitioner, but, but forever on throughout his career, he'd always have to find an architect to take the Vox role to design the structures within a park. And so he had a whole series of other architects he worked with over, over his career. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.